Welcome to the HJ Talks About Abuse podcast. In this podcast, we talk about sexual abuse cases in the hope it will assist listeners in openly discussing topics which have been ignored for too long. This podcast is brought to you by the abuse team at Hugh James. We are lawyers, so we do tend to speak about the legal aspects of abuse cases, but we aren't too shy to speak up about the broader issues faced by survivors too. Hello, podcast listeners. I'm Alan Collins, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Sam Barker. Hello. Podcast listeners, we are going to be discussing the recent Hugh James Abuse Conference that was held in Cardiff on the 13th of February. This was a conference where we were delighted to welcome a range of speakers who were able to give talks and lectures on a wide range of child abuse issues and subjects. And in the audience, we had people who work with children in need, the police, the medical profession, legal profession, social workers, probation, as well as civil servants concerned with child abuse issues. And the range of subjects was wide. And I think one of the, for me personally, one of the most interesting subjects was actually the one that you gave a a talk on, Sam, um, which was all to do with Consent. How kind of you to say? Yeah, I'm buttering you up. You don't know what you don't know what's around the corner. No, but joking aside, consent is a big issue yeah. currently. And you gave a very interesting talk, and I know it was well received by the audience. Mm. So, why did you choose the subject of consent? I chose it because, first of all, I thought that the audience would find it interesting. But secondly, to kind of explain to the audience how difficult this issue is in civil cases that arise out of child sexual abuse. And the mere fact that there has been a conviction under the Sexual Offences Act 2003 for a sex offence involving a child doesn't necessarily mean that there is a viable civil claim as of right because there could be a defence of consent. And although that sounds crazy, it is the case and has happened many times. Indeed, I think the audience was quite surprised, if not shocked, when you explained to them that consent is run as a defence. Indeed. Well, if you look at... So one of the examples I had was Section 9 of the Sexual Offences Act 2003. It involves uh, sexual activity with a child it's a child under the age of 16. And given that the age of consent in this country is 16, there is rightfully no part of that section that deals with a lack of consent or needing to prove a lack of consent. And it's that very issue that poses a problem in the civil law, because if you run a civil case arising out of, say, if that person was convicted under section nine, in, 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 the, in civil litigation, consent is a question of fact it's not a question of how old you are. So it's obviously going to be very persuasive that if, you know, if the child is 13 or something like that, very persuasive, but, you know, it is conceivable and indeed we've seen it happen where a defendant says, well, actually the child was consenting. Yeah, you know, we might find it ab- obnoxious and abhorrent and unbelievable, but that is the reality. Yeah, absolutely. That's right. And also we also know that even the courts sometimes struggle with understanding what consent is, because there's been the high-profile case that you referred to, which um, caused general consternation. Yeah. Consent is a big issue, and it's an issue that's on a bit of a steep learning curve, I think, personally. Yeah, me too. It's a, there's a lot happening in relation so to So also that. at our conference, we heard from Professor John Bisson, who's yep. a consultant psychiatrist, and he spoke about adverse childhood experiences yeah and he presented his own research i believe into into this at cardiff university and it was very interesting because he was demonstrating how you needed to nip the problem in the bud very very early on because the consequences of not doing so are profound yeah it it, it, his his presentation, I think, to me, illustrated how important these kind of conferences are because what we're doing is dealing with professionals who assist survivors at a later stage in their life, uh, adult survivors of childhood sexual abuse, to be able to deal with you know, the trauma that's inflicted and indeed um, all of the things that fall out in relation to that, civil litigation, criminal litigation, needing trauma counselling, all of that. But then also we had um, a contingent there who focus on trying to you know, obviate the problem before it ever occurs. And Professor Bisson's research provided a really interesting and alarming foundation for all of that because what he presented was about adverse childhood experiences and 
how that increases the propensity for somebody who has experienced four or more of those to do things like engage in problem drinking, commit violence against another person, use crack cocaine, heroin, etc. And those those findings I thought were um, were really interesting, if not quite saddening. And that sort of neatly fits in with the report that came out the week before, which was the multi-agency report published by the Inspectorate of Constabulary and Probation, Ofsted and others, which was basically saying there's got to be a lot more work and research in respect of these issues, because if as a country we're going to stand any kind of chance of tackling child sexual abuse, we need to understand a lot more about why it happens. Yep. And only when we actually have some real insight into why it all happens in the first place, will we be equipped to try and prevent it from happening? Yeah, absolutely. You need to get ahead of the problem and and deal with these foundation Where issues. Well, it's quite clearly at the, from my take of what we heard at the conference was, yeah, great work's being done fantastic what people are doing but we're not ahead of the curve we're, no. we're lagging well behind well the, the perfect illustration of that is the cica you know the cica is there it's designed it's intended to help victims of crime and a lot of the time it leaves survivors of sexual abuse completely out in the cold completely without compensation for things that are a direct effect of their abuse and if i can explain by reference to Professor Bisson's findings. So under the CICA, if you have an unspent conviction, you are precluded from any compensation. And that is something that very often leaves survivors of sexual abuse without any recourse to compensation. But Professor Bisson's findings are that if, for example, you have experienced four or more adverse childhood experiences, um, an adverse childhood experience being, for example, physical abuse, sexual abuse, a parent being in prison, witnessing verbal abuse in the house, etc. If you experience four or more of those, you are 20 times more likely to have been incarcerated at some point in, the, in in your lifetime. So obviously, it's extraordinary. It is extraordinary. It? So obviously, the background of that is that you're going to have some sort of conviction. Plus, somebody who's been incarcerated, those convictions do not become spent. Or 15 times more likely to have committed violence against another person in the past 12 months alone. Mm. So what you're looking at there is a direct link between these people who have had adverse childhood experiences, which include childhood sexual abuse, uh, physical abuse, or clearly crimes committed against this person. They've got an increased susceptibility to commit crimes themselves. The significance of those crimes, I'm not saying whether, you know, whether it's murder or simply property damage, it can be either. The CICA doesn't care. You know, you can be precluded from throwing a bottle against a wall and being given a caution for, you know, so being given a youth rehabilitation order for, for criminal damage. And you'll be precluded. And yeah. this is something that's a direct result, as you can see from these findings, of being But if you, you know, took abused. one individual, just one individual, who had been subjected to four or more adverse childhood experiences... And let us, you know, and they ended up as someone who gets embroiled with the criminal justice system, gets involved with drugs, commits violence. The cost in human terms, let alone financial terms, must be extraordinary. Absolutely. The cost to society in wasted lives, troubled lives, it doesn't bear thinking about. Mm. Then there's the financial cost that everyone has to pick up. The cost is extraordinary. Well, 20 times more likely to be incarcerated. Think about how mm. expensive it is. Yeah. Not only go through the criminal process, legal aid lawyers, trial time, you know, the judge's time, everything like that, pre-sentencing reports, everything, and then the cost of being incarcerated, which That's is right. monumental. That's right, being kept by prison officers and the people who work in the prison to try and manage this person and try and turn them around in some way and so on. It's just, you know, out of the labour market, then they come out and, as we all know, it's very difficult for offenders to get into meaningful employment and settle down and so on. You know, it's just, you know, the cost is just extraordinary. So it's in the interest, I say it's very simple, it's in the interest of, of us all to try and get ahead of the curve. But it needs a willingness to try and understand why all this happens in the first place. And yeah. we're not, we're not, I don't think, 
making sufficient attempts to do it. Well, that's what these kind of conferences, I think, are vitally important for that kind of thing, because you're bringing together professionals from different sectors to try and have some joined up thinking about all of this, rather than people operating in silos, which just happens so often. Mm. You know, you're going to have a hospital down the road with people who deal with I don't even know how to express it really, but you know, you're going to have all these different sectors and people having a look. Yeah, you're going to have people who deal with offenders themselves, uh, you know, and, and assisting them once that they get out of prison. You're going to have people who deal with um, survivors of sexual assault. You're going to have de- people with deal- who deal with abusers themselves, children who have been abused. You know, all of these things, all, all of these sectors and these professionals, they would have insights, they would have knowledge that can definitely be shared to try to curb this problem that is childhood sexual abuse very early on. But it's, a, it's something that requires that kind of thinking to be exchanged and, and spoken about. Yeah. I think. Yes. Terribly yeah. expressed. <laughs> no, I understood. And um, well made point. And uh, I think the challenge for... 2020 and 2021 is for the powers that be to pick up on what we heard at the conference and also on this multi-agency report. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Sam. Thank you, listeners. Thank Please you. tune in to our next podcast. Thank you for listening to this episode of HJ Talks About Abuse. You can subscribe to our podcast on iTunes, Spotify, and Google Play. If you would like to speak to Alan or I about something you have heard this week, or even if you would like to suggest a topic for a future episode, please do get in touch at aboutabuse at hjtalks.co.uk. 